we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that government is established to secure those rights. The Article 5 State Legislators Caucus and Path to Reform welcome you to this webinar, Strengthening the American Voice, featuring Ken Ivory, former Utah State Representative, Neil Schur, former Iowa State Senator, and Kevin Lundberg, former Colorado State Senator. Welcome everyone to the second in a series of webinars hosted by uh, State Legislators Article 5 Caucus and Path to Reform. I'm Neil Shearer. I'm going to be the host tonight. And for tonight, our goal for the webinar is to strengthen the American voice. We want to bolster our state legislators' natural embrace of the role as the voice of the American people. The microphone for the American voice is in your hand, state legislators. And you, we want you, as you're representing your constituents, their values and their views, we want you to have a loud and clear voice in this constitutional republic that we have. And then we want to continue to build a collaboration among all state legislators and state leaders in all the states. That is the role of state legislators Article 5 caucus and the mission for paths to reform. So that's our purpose tonight. That's what we hope to uh, communicate to you through uh, the conversation we're going to have here tonight. Uh, in the second half of this evening, we're going to have a question and answer period so that you can propose some questions to, our, to myself and to Kevin Lundberg and to Ken Ivory. We're going to be talking as a panel and being putting our collective minds together and operating uh, moving forward. Also, the chat room feature is available so that you can uh, communicate with other participants. You can share your ideas with us and the other participants. And we encourage everyone to use that chat feature and keep that available. Uh, now to get started, I'd like to take just a moment and uh, introduce uh, Ken Ivory to everyone. Uh, Ken Ivory is a former Utah House member he was also, Ken was also a leader at the Arizona planning convention that was held in September of 2017. That's where I met Ken. Ken also served as the president of the Williamsburg simulation convention that was held in 2016. But what's interesting about the Arizona planning convention that was called by the state of Arizona, it was the first convention of state call, states called since 1861. So check that history out and see how that fits in. Uh, Ken is a prolific writer. Uh, he writes for NCSL, the National Conference of State Legislature, serves on task force, uh, also with the uh, Council of State Governments, CSG, uh, ALEC, American Legislative Exchange Council. Uh, Ken is just, his material is out there. If you uh, search him on uh, Google and things like that, you'll find some of his fine writings. Uh, Ken also teaches constitutional theory at Utah Valley University. So their Center for Constitutional Studies also has a lot of Ken's writings and activities. So as you meet Ken tonight and, and hear from him, I'm sure you're going to want to go out and, and get more of his material. Uh, Kevin Lundberg. Uh, Kevin, uh, I met Kevin back in 2015 when I started getting involved in this uh, effort of uh, bringing states together. Uh, Kevin served in the Colorado House and in the Colorado Senate. Kevin is a leader in the National Article 5 movement, and he's one of the founding members of the State Legislators Article 5 Caucus, which began back in 2014. And if you haven't had a chance to see that website and to access the newsletter, uh, current timely information about state's role uh, in this national government, and really encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, Kevin is also on the board of Colorado Christian University. And Kevin currently ment mentors and, inform and informs his Senate colleagues and House members as executive director of the Republican uh, Study Committee of Colorado. So uh, I think this evening you're going to be hearing some uh, great insights from both 
Ken and Kevin and myself on uh, where we go from here and uh, uh, the country and the role of the state. So that's what we're going to be doing tonight. Um, right now, I just want to kind of lay out a little bit where we're at today. You know, it, it's just an interesting place that we're in. Um, I served in the Iowa Senate for two terms in the late 90s and early 2000s. It was a great experience, wonderful experience. And, you know, stepping away from that, I did feel that there was a more prominent role of states and legislatures in dealing with the national issues. And in 2015, as I got involved in the national Article 5 movement, it really uh, cemented for me what we have to do to reconcile this country, bring the country together. Because I think one thing that we learned from this election is that this country is divided. And the right and the left, I'm gonna use the terms tonight, conservative and progressive. We can be red or blue states, whatever the word you wanna use. We are definitely divided. Uh, this last election of re reaffirms that. This past year of protests and riot rioting, COVID, and, and what it does, it, it just brings uncertainty out there. And when we have uncertainty, uh, it brings in fear and, and trust is lacking and trusting in the confidence in the system and the things that we've done here. Um, but what it does do, it just shines a light on the role of states and state legislatures to step up to the plate take on their constitutional responsibility that is outlined in the constitution and, and deal with that situation so that uh, we are the state legislators, you are uh, the voice of the American people. And we hope that through this conversation, you will be strengthened to take those steps out there and take those constitutional roles that you have. Uh, I served in a very, in a rural district in Iowa uh, and, and there's that urban rural divide. And we see that even with the small states, big states. We even see it within states where you've got large metropolitan areas and the rural parts of those states feel like their voice isn't being heard. It's not being represented. So those are some of the things we want to uh, encourage and, and, and provide you with information, empower you to take that step and be that voice for all people, all of the people that you represent in your house district or your Senate district, and then the states stepping up and reaffirming their responsibility to be at the table on national policy as the Congress and as the president uh, deals with national issues and those lines are clearly defined. One of the things that I find is, is something that is a particular interest of me, and that is over the, over the course of these next 20 or 30 years, 30 years, 2050, 70% of the US population is gonna be in 15 states. And that's gonna create a lot of issues and a lot of conversations and a lot of discussion. Uh, the electoral college is in the place, uh, representation uh, in the US Senate, in the House of Representatives, all of those things. States need to step up now and put a plan in place so that is equally balanced. So the voice is heard from those small states, from those rural states, uh, from some small population states so that they just aren't being uh, dragged along with the high population states and the urban centers that are out there. So something to consider, something to think about. And as we move forward, I, one of the things we, we talk about and we talk about a lot is in, in the preamble to the constitution, we do all of these things to form a more perfect union. And as I was communicating with Kevin and Ken, as we were preparing for this, one of the points that Ken really shared with me is this creating this more perfect union was re is really guarding against the accumulation of power in the hands of a president in specific or the national government in general was the primary purpose of our more perfect union. Why this promise was made, why this constitution was agreed to. And I'm gonna say it kind of in my own uh, simple rural language is, another way of saying it is, are we just 50 states that are just administrative units of the national government or are we sovereign? And I want you state legislators to decide. Uh, Ken, 
how do we go from here and, and kind of share with, uh, with the folks a little bit of, of how we got to this place where uh, some people call it a constitutional crisis or uh, we're at a place where really states have to step up to the plate. We, um, I love the title, Strengthen the American Voice. You know, the founders gave birth to a new nation. I mean, think about that. They gave birth to a brand new nation. Uh, that's hard to even imagine. We've, we've had some experiences this last week that uh, in our family, we had the birth of a new grandson just last week. Uh, and that has us, our minds so much uh, sighted forward to what this whole experiment is about. And as Kevin mentioned in the opening that in giving birth to a new nation, they wanted that voice to be strengthened for everyone. That, that the very purpose of government was to secure the rights of life, liberty, and that unique pursuit of happiness that that grandson of ours and yours and your family and every member of your district can pursue their unique and diverse vision of happiness and enable others to do so to the, to the greatest extent. And, and to do that, government, ex governments exist among men. And so the founders in giving birth to this nation looked specifically at what kind of government will give the greatest expression to the American voice. Uh, certainly monarchy, they looked at that. They were fighting against a monarchy. That wasn't an option. They looked at pure democracy and, and they made uh, statements that uh, democracies are as short in their lives as they are violent in their death, pure democracy. And then they, they looked at Republic, which is a representative government, uh, a government of laws that protects minority interests as well as reflecting the, the voice and the will of the people. And, and James Madison said, this is even gonna be different than a, than a typical Republic. And, and so when they looked at the type of government, you know, we, we, we look at what government is, and typically we start here and say, say it's, it's separation of powers and executive, legislative and judicial. And James Madison tells us that that's a single Republic and that's not our type of government. And he said in the compound Republic of America, in a single republic, you divide power by executive, legislative, and judicial, and you have checks that way. But in the compound republic of America, the power surrendered by the people is first divided among two distinct governments, state and national, so that a double security arises to the rights of the people because those different governments will control each other at the same time they control themselves. And so our government, the very nature of our government is not not just the separation of powers, but it's this, this two spheres of government where you have the state and separated within them and the national government and separations within them. That's the picture, that's the image, that's the form of our government. And it doesn't stop there because then they looked at the allocation of power and they said that the power delegated to the national government is few and defined for, for interstate and international related matters. And the powers that remained to the states were numerous and indefinite. Most of the things that concern the lives, liberties, and the property of the people. And that was specifically to empower and magnify and enhance the American voice, that you could participate in your government at the most local level. Your representatives reflect you. They're your neighbors. And your voice is, is directly uh, impacted through them. And so to think that the states need to be more powerful as states, it, it wasn't that at all. The very system of our government divided power so that your voice was amplified uh, across the entire diverse nation. And so uh, Alexander Hamilton in the New York Ratifying Convention said that this balance of power between the state and national government ought to be dwelt on with peculiar attention as it is of the utmost importance because it forms a double security to the people. And so when you think about that balance, well, how do you measure balance? Are we in balance today as a government and by, by all measures? Uh, all surveys, all polls, we're, we're completely out of balance. Government is not balanced. And, and even at the national level between the branches, it's not balanced. And that was so critical, that, that balance of the machine that they designed to enhance and preserve and expand the American voice. But it's a this balance needs to be dwelt on with peculiar attention. Well, the first question is what is and should that balance be? And then what does it mean to pay peculiar attention to the balance. Well, most of the time in, in, in our duties, in our legislative functions, we're uh, concerned about a number of things, but they said that 
this was of the utmost importance to pay particular attention to this balance because that's what enhances the voice. That's what gives a double security to the rights of the people. And so, so in looking at that, we need to look at what is the balance. We need to pay particular attention to that above all other things because it was the nature of that mechanism that, that secured the rights and then provided uh, the double security that this should be of the utmost attention. And when we don't pay peculiar attention, our government ends up looking uh, more like this. And I think that's how a lot of Americans are feeling today, that the government just feels out of control. It feels as if it is uh, gobbling up power and gobbling up our voice. And many people are disengaging because there's no structure, there's no form, there's no balance to the government. Well, they told us very clearly that uh, in uh, the NFIB case, the dissenting judges said that the structural protections of liberty, this separation of powers and federalism, the structure of our government was the most important aspect of the constitution. And they said, that's why it was drafted right into the constitution and not left to later amendments. The fragmentation of power, this dividing power and amplifying voice is central to liberty. And when we destroy it, we put liberty at peril. And James Madison reminded us that it was the state legislatures that would jealously and closely watch the operations of the government, op watch this balance, watch this very nature of the government. And they'd be able to resist every assumption of power better than any power on earth can do because the state legislatures are the sure guardians of the people's liberty. And so it becomes something much more than just who has the power. It's, it's maintaining balance in the system to secure the rights, to amplify the voice of the people. In Utah this year, they passed a resolution to begin a process of determining just what is the balance, defining what those lines and limits are, determining the powers and having a system that we can then maintain for the rights and the voice of the American people. And so in uh, HCR 16, the concurrent resolution calling for a national federalism task force to get the main legislative groups together uh, National Conference of State Legislatures, the Council of State Governments, and the American Legislative Exchange Council to define the balance, to, to re-examine the balance, and then to come to that agreement as to what the lines are that we defend so that we can keep that government in balance so that people are engaged, they do have that voice, and, uh, and we, we, we know what lines we're defending. Uh, just one of the greatest statements on the very nature of the system. It's not state versus national. It's not us versus them. It's not left versus right. There was a system of government that had a national government and state governments cooperating together. James Wilson said, like planets in harmonious orbits, that the powers of government should be both divided and balanced among the several uh, spheres of government that no one could transcend their legal limits without being checked and restrained by the others. And it was that system of government that preserves and enhances our voice. And clearly, in order for us to strengthen the American voice, for our people to have a, a stance in their government, to have accountability and effectiveness and efficiency in government, it's time to repaint these lines on the field. And we would urge you and encourage you to look at that, uh, that HCR 16 and run that resolution in your state so that these organizations work together and we get the clear definition of the lines and the limits. And so we know what we're defending as state legislatures. We operate within that system of government, not us versus them. It gets back to those harmonious uh, spheres of government uh, operating together with, with defined roles and responsibilities. And without that, clearly we're, we're like that job of the Fed uh, operating with no lines on the field. And it's, uh, it's time for us to give voice to our people. So with that, Neil, I'll turn the time uh, over to Kevin. Kevin, why don't you just uh, step right in there and and kind of give us a sense of where, you know, explanation where we are headed as a country, where you feel uh, America needs to be going. You might say uh, Ken gave the the uh, ideal perspective of why we have this uh, compound form of government uh, within our constitutional structure. But uh, I can tell you that uh, having been a state legislator for about 16 years, um, I didn't find it to be the truth very often. What I found was the federal government would uh, uh, decide something, either the executive branch or, or Congress or even the Supreme Court would send down a, uh, some dictate 
and the state would scramble to uh, try to fall in line with it. Um, and uh, there was a whole lot of imbalance that we've had and that we do have, and a lot of uh, misunderstanding on the part of, uh, I know many of my legislative colleagues in Colorado didn't even give a second thought to whether they should be the, uh, the, the check and the balance on the uh, federal government in, in far too many cases. And um, I came to the conclusion very early on that uh, we need a conversation on this and then we need action to back it up. And the, the first step is the conversation. And that's what we're doing right here. Uh, you might argue that we are simply uh, preaching to the choir, that there are uh, 7,000 plus uh, legislators out there who really aren't asking these questions uh, uh, very seriously at least. But where we need to go from here is we need to remind all of our colleagues in each legislative body that they have the, uh, 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 the, the many and the un, you know, the, the, the Congress is the few and the defined enumerated rights or responsibilities. I, I don't want to say rights because government doesn't have rights. Individuals have rights, but governments have authority and they have uh, the ability to do a great deal. Uh, we need to understand that at the state level, we have the ultimate authority and it is up to us to, to really make the difference. You know, the last few weeks uh, have been a real uh, chaos in a lot of our government systems with an election that that uh, uh, doesn't seem to to end that in uh, ended on election night with a whole lot of questions more than answers and um, as much as I have very strong opinions on how that should be uh, ultimately I believe the real challenge before us is to understand the role that state legislators have and state legislatures possess in determining what the future is for this country. And it's a good future. It, it has so much prospect for, uh, 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 for positive things if we will seize the, the uh, tools that have been given to us uh, by our uh, founding uh, 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 fathers uh, who have, have constructed a system of government that, is, uh, that, that can be so effective in, in not just going down a, a singular path. You know, if, if everything was ruled from the top down, then there'd be only one opinion that would be allowed and only one course of action that would be possible. But with our system of government where federalism really is the, the key, then, um, then there, can, there, there can be progress in, from many perspectives all at once in a, in a very uh, good way. And, and that's really uh, one of the things that has been uh, the, uh, you know, I've heard it to, uh, stated that, that, the, uh, uh, that the state governments are, are those uh, laboratories uh, for um, uh, governance. And it is in those laboratories that they need to have the ability to, to thrive and not be just controlled from the top down. So what is our prospect? It's very bright if we will but seize it. And it's very possible if we will promote it. With that, Neil, I think I'm gonna, gonna leave it there for now and we can pursue it uh, corporately. Okay, very good, very good, Kevin. And Kevin and Ken, thank you so much for uh, just kind of sharing uh, that point of view, kind of where, we, where we've where come from and where we're going. I think the conversation we're gonna have here is going to uh, be very good. Uh, both uh, Ken and Kevin were able to present to a group of state legislators at a wall builders conference just over the weekend. And I'd like to just have you uh, kind of both speak into what you learned meeting with some uh, seasoned or incumbent state legislators and also some new ones because it's encouraged for new legislators to attend that, uh, that workshop or conference and, and just kind of share with us a little bit the, the attitude and the tone out there of our elected representatives from the many states. Well, let me jump in first uh, very quickly and, and say that uh, it was uh, 
quite a refreshing uh, uh, moment to actually join with legislators from around the country in this year of virtual meetings. I mean, I, I don't want to speak down in virtual meetings here. We're doing it right here and now. But to actually meet them face to face and have discussions and find out where their real uh, 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 concerns are right now was a good touchstone with reality. And the reality I saw were uh, a lot of, of uh, people who are deeply concerned with what they see today, but are up to the task and the challenge of moving forward. And, and you know, this again is the, 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 uh, 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 the extraordinary characteristic of federalism where each state has its own path to, to go and, and uh, individual circumstances that, that really drive one direction or another. I saw a lot of people who are very, very um, uh, uh, charged up, concerned with where we're at, but, but uh, I think they're e equal to the challenge and, and they're ready to go in 2021. Okay, very good. Thanks, Kevin. Ken? Uh, yeah, I agree with Kevin. Very refreshing to be face-to-face uh, -face with uh, good state <laughs> legislators across the nation who are committed to these principles. I think, um, Neil, um, with all that's going on in our nation, I think people are, are really coming to the realization that, that we have to do something different. Uh, you know, we're... we're, we're we, the, the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We keep thinking that, that if we elect a different president or somebody new every four years, that things are going to change. And, and it, it's the system, it's this structure, it's this balance that we're supposed to have in the system. And I think people are waking up to the fact that, you know, like a bicycle with a bloated front tire and a flat back tire, it doesn't matter if we change the rider and it doesn't matter if they yank the handlebars to the right or the left. We have to fix the balance in the vehicle. And uh, I, I think there's a, an awareness and a waking up to that. And I think that's very good because that's what the founders gave us. They gave us a, a structure and a system to secure the rights. They didn't rely on, on people or policy. It was about a structure that they meticulously designed to secure these rights. Well, that's, that's excellent in, in terms of doing that. And one thing that's really been interesting since we uh, you know, finished our election a uh, little over a week ago and going through the recount process now and conversations about uh, whether there was some uh, uh, improper voting processes and things like that. I have never heard so much conversation about the constitution and the constitution that uh, we have and how decisions are going to be made. And that's one of the key features I think uh, what we have to keep looking for is making sure that everyone, uh, you know, the average American, but more particularly the state legislatures and legislators understand the process that's involved in the, in the U.S. Constitution, that relationship between the states and the national government that, that the states created. I know when I uh, walked away from the, my state Senate seat, and kind of looking back and reflecting, I sometimes wondered, I said to myself, well, what did I really get done? And you know, you had a quite a large bureaucracy in a state, you know, we pass laws, rules come out. It is really something that state legislators, I believe, really have to embrace uh, their legislative role and not just give broad uh, privileges to an executive or to a, uh, a bureaucracy. And I think the same thing needs to apply to our national government and the states really have to come in and reorder that relationship that's going on. Uh, what are your thoughts on that in, in terms of uh, states stepping up to the plate and, and really reordering the relationship between the, the states and the national government? Well, Ken, uh, yeah, Ken and Neil yes. <laughs> and everyone else. Uh, for, um, I don't want to paint too rosy a picture, you know, saying, well, we certainly can, we're up to the task and we can, we can do this because there are a lot of people who have a very different idea of what government is, is for. Um, and in today's 21st century uh, culture, uh, a lot of people have more of an entitlement uh, attitude towards government. What can I get out of it? What are they going to do for me today? Uh, and ultimately, that just doesn't work. 
Um, but what I see is a need for, and, and this is what does encourage me, is I find more and more, even as Neil, you said, more people are asking the question, what, what does the Constitution say? What, where, where are the guardrails that we're to uh, uh, follow? And uh, I see a, a greater sense on the part of those who, who uh, um, really appreciate the principles that our government was founded on, the, the idea of the division of power and the balance rather than the empowerment of government. We want to empower the people. Uh, and, and that can only happen when we do plug in these principles of federalism. Um, so I, I see people doing, but this is not the time for, for timidity or for, uh, you know, to, to sit back and watch the process. If you're a state legislator, you've got a job to do and you've got a big job ahead of you uh, if, at this point in, the, in this time. Yeah. And Neil, this is a great opportunity to teach. Um, I was in a, a fifth grade classroom and the question was, what's going on with the election and why do we have this crazy election system? He said, that's a great question. And, and I asked if any of them had seen the World Series and a few hands shot up and said, do you know who won the World Series? Well, of course, the Dodgers won. And who did they play? Well, they played the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. Well, how many games did the Dodgers have to win? Well, they had to win four games. I said, well, well why is that the case? I said, suppose, suppose that in game one, Tampa Bay scored 40 runs and Los Angeles got none. And the next game, Los Angeles wins two to one. And the next game, they win two to one. And the next game, they win two to one. And then the next game, they win two to, two to one. How many runs will Tampa Bay have scored? These fifth graders just shot out 44 runs. Well, how many runs will the Dodgers have scored? They would have only scored eight. Well, then, of course, the Tampa Bay Devil Rays should be the World Series champions. They said, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. Well, that's crazy. They scored 44 runs and Los Angeles only scored eight. How could that be? because the system requires that you're better on four nights out of seven. You're better over a period of time than just running up the score in one game. And, and the founders looked at how do we want to elect a president? And rather than running up the score in one state or one city, they wanted a president that was better over the vast majority of the country. And they designed a very unique system in the electoral college to elect a president that was both representative of the people and of the nation itself across this vast territory. So we have a great opportunity to teach and educate how these principles divide power and reflect the diversity of our nation. And this is something to embrace and go into, and it, it's a wonderful time to teach. Excellent, excellent. I, you know, and, and as I, you know, teaching and, and looking at, and you know, we, we talk so much about the constitution, but I sometimes think we forget that there's 50 other constitutions that are out there. Each state has a constitution. And I would have to say when I was a state legislator, it probably took me into my second term before I really took a serious look at the Iowa constitution. And now a resident here in Colorado looking at the constitution. And we also have to remember that uh, several of the early states had constitutions that predated the union predated the, uh, the US Constitution and they used some of the things they learned and crafting their constitutions uh, in building the US Constitution. So this is this agreement we have amongst ourselves in a state and amongst ourselves in this union that we really have to uh, focus on and understand, as you say so eloquently, Ken, you know, where are the lines? What are the rules of play? So that everyone feels that they're being uh, treated fairly. Uh, this is also, November is also the 400th anniversary of the signing of the Mayflower Compact as a group of uh, pilgrims got uh, waylaid on their way to Virginia and ended up in Massachusetts and, uh, and, and their the first agreement in self-government. And those are those first principles that uh, we just have to constantly remind ourselves. So you know, just in this conversation, each Ken and Kevin, if, if you could point out what are some of those first principles that we 
all need to be really looking at, and maybe particularly state legislators as they're serving and sitting in those chambers and in sitting in desks and in hallways and, and meeting rooms uh, uh, that uh, for you know, many years before others have served there. What would, what would be some first principles that you would uh, pass on to those individuals listening tonight? Kevin, I'll jump in again. <laughs> and and uh, one of the things that comes to my mind immediately is, is uh, when, when I was first sworn in and raised my right hand and, and placed my other hand on a Bible and, and, and swore to uphold the constitutions of the United States and uh, for myself, the state of Colorado. Um, you're, you're quite right. Far too often, legislators don't really put that at the top of the list. And uh, oftentimes, I, I know it, in the Colorado legislature, uh, I was considered an expert in the Constitution. And I found that rather curious because the only difference between me and many of my colleagues is I sat down and I read it a couple of times. <laughs> uh, you know, and so, and so I'd refer to it and would would point out, you know, here, here are the lines in the field that, that uh, were, were established for us and that we have sworn an oath to uphold. Uh, so I, I'd say that's one very important principle. Uh, another one is to dig into the Bill of Rights where the rights of the citizens are enumerated and the authority of the states are made clear in the 10th Amendment. Um, that's a first principle in my mind. Uh, I was reading a, uh, uh, an analysis from the Colorado Legislative Council on um, what, uh, what quarantine is today. And I noticed that, uh, that the one thing they missed was how that squares up with the rights of the citizens for the freedom of assembly and, and for all of the other inalienable rights that we have. And they just kind of glossed all over that and said, well, here's, here's how we can quarantine you and here's how we can isolate you. And, and the first question shouldn't be, what do the rules and the statutes say? The first question should be, what do the principles within our constitutions uh, spell out? Because be it a crisis or be it a, a, a time of prosperity and peace, um, it's the same constitution and it's the same rights of the individuals that need to be upheld. Remember, government doesn't exist to promote and perpetuate the economy or government. It is to secure the rights of the, of the individuals. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Uh, Neil, it, uh, when you say the first principles, I think the most important thing we can emphasize reminds me of a, a story that I was guest lecturing uh, before I started teaching at Utah Valley University and I got I got there a little bit early and and I thought well there's a, a, a snack machine I thought I'd get something to eat and, and I go to line up at the machine and, and there was a young man in front of me and he put his money in the slot and made his selection and the and the dial turned a quarter tie a quarter turn and his item just hung up in the machine and you all know what he did, right? He starts beating the machine and kicking the machine and rocking the machine and swearing at the machine. And, and the whole time I'm standing there watching this thinking, I'm next. <laughs> I'd like that machine to work when it's my turn. <laughs> and he could care less about the machine. He just wanted his, his candy bar and could care less about the machine. And I went in and gave an entirely different lecture to the students. Said, we have a machine that was fine-tuned, unique, novel, never existed before, an entirely new kind of machine to produce the greatest liberty the world has ever seen, the greatest pursuit of happiness the world has ever seen. And there's a generation that's next. And right now we're beating the machine and kicking the machine and swearing at the machine and rocking it to get the candy bar that we want. And we've got to maintain the machine. And so this idea of, of balance and limits and checks. That's not a nice to have. It's not something that you've got our power so we want it. That's the nature of the machine that delivers the pursuit of happiness across a diverse nation. 
And there are only two parties that can affect that balance, but only one ever will. Washington's never gonna, gonna stand up and check its own power. The only party that will maintain that balance, the only party that'll pull out the blueprint and look at how to restore that machine to its operating principles are the state legislators. And so this is your time to shine. This is your time to gather together, to gather together in your organizations that, that, that you can magnify your leverage through NCSL and CSG and ALEC and get those organizations together by your order to begin working on these lines and these limits so that you have lines and, and powers clearly defined and understood so you know where to stand on the field and defend. I would say that is the absolute clearest principle as Thomas Jefferson said, the entire foundation of our government is laid on this. And then he refers to the 10th amendment. The powers delegated to the national government um, by the constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states express, expressly or to the people. And, and that's the very foundation of our government. We need to get back to that, those roles and responsibilities so we have clarity that magnifies the uh, voice of the American people. Okay, very good. Well, thank you. Well, we're gonna transition a little bit into some of the questions that we've been getting. And a, a lot of the questions are from uh, individuals that you know, really want to have their voice being heard and have worked with their state legislators to advance an application for a call for an Article 5 convention. And it, it's, it, I guess the word was, it seems like they're getting a little weary out there, just not able to seem to get the ball over the line to get to a place where states could meet in convention. Um, the experience, uh, I know Kevin, you were there, so were you, Ken, at the Arizona Planning Convention. And uh, we were with great anticipation, you know, getting to the place to have states consider whether the national government should have a balanced budget parameters like most, almost all the states do. And we did a great job there in terms of working out all the details, the rules and planning. But I walked away from that with 19 states there, 70 some legislators, a few formers like myself, and things like that. And you were chosen as a vice president of that uh, convention, Ken. But I walked away from that setting absolutely believing I've got to do everything in my power to get states together meeting in convention, talking about national issues, and reordering that relationship. Uh, again, Ken and Kevin, how would you answer that question? Is it getting weary out there? We just can't seem to get the ball over the over the goal line. Uh, what kind of words do you have for those individuals? I've talked first, Ken. Why don't you take it and I'll uh, do cleanup. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, uh, I love the, the Ronald Reagan statement that uh, it's a wonderful time to be alive. We're lucky not to live in pale and timid times. We've been blessed with the opportunity to stand for something. You know, liberty, freedom, fairness, these are things worth fighting for or worth devoting our lives to. And we need to go forth with good cheer and stout hearts and be happy warriors. Uh, this is, th this system has been exported to virtually every country in the world as is borrowed from our constitution. And, and if we allow that, that distribution of power, that divided and limited and balanced government that enhances our voice, if we allow that to fade in America, who, who upholds those principles that we really can govern ourselves? Jefferson said that was the great question, whether man could govern themselves or, or we were destined to be uh, ruled over. And, and uh, I think that question, uh, we have to prove again and again that clearly we are able to govern ourselves. And so we have to redouble our efforts. Um, it can start with efforts like Utah. I mean, you work toward conventions and those sorts of things, but, but getting the state organizations that represent you in your states, getting them together to begin defining those lines, begin defining the roles and responsibilities so that there's governing clarity, that's the starting point in any organization. And so we need to take that responsibility and, and take those initial steps and, and move toward the bigger goals. Yeah, you, you know, I've been uh, involved with the Article 5 effort uh, for, well, I'm in my eighth year of working on it uh, pretty hard, uh, but never was that actually my goal. The real purpose in my mind 
is to reestablish those principles of federalism. And Article Five is is the most extraordinary constitutional tool that the states have been given. But it's not the only thing that's out there. And uh, uh, recently, I've kind of reoriented my focus for the short term, recognizing that that if you look at it state by state, uh, I honestly don't see a critical mass for um, finding 34 states to pass the same resolution all at once right now. Um, now I haven't given up hope or, or uh, uh, that, that we will prevail in, in some ways, but, but whether or not we do, that's not the real point. The point is to reestablish those principles of federalism, to go back to the 10th Amendment and, and, and uh, 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 encourage states and state legislatures to apply those principles in a very real and tangible way. Um, uh, this year, what I'm encouraging people to do, and by this year, I mean really 2021, uh, is for states to reintroduce the discussion in their legislatures. Uh, the best tool I know there is, is a resolution of some sort uh, to, to simply get the legislature to discuss it and hopefully to endorse the principle. And you can, you can take a variety of resolutions that uh, either uh, uh, promote and, and, uh, and, and speak of the benefits of the 10th Amendment or federalism in general, or uh, Ken introduced uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, concept of this resolution that uh, Utah passed this past year calling for a national federalism task force among the major legislative organizations across the country. Uh, I believe these are all very useful tools and uh, very productive steps that can be taken today. And uh, win or lose the resolution in your state, you're, you're encouraging more and more people uh, in, in your legislative body to consider the merits of federalism. Uh, far too often we're stuck with, you know, all of the day-to-day -day, uh, issues that come from the hundreds and sometimes thousands of bills that are before us, and we lose sight of the, the first principles, as Neil pointed out. And in this case, I believe we can strengthen the voice of state legislatures and states by, by um, uh, re-embracing the value that we have in the very principles of federalism. Excellent, excellent. You know, Neil, one other point yes. to that is uh, the resolution in Utah had, had super majority bipartisan support. And, and you're seeing red and blue states saying, hey, I want my voice back. I want the voice of my people to matter. And they may not know to call it federalism and, and they may not know the name to put it, but, but people are clearly, uh, overwhelming majorities of Americans. Uh, Frank Luntz has done polling nationally that 75, 80% of the people believe that government's not efficient, effective, or accountable, but they trust their state leaders. They look to their state leaders to restore that. And so when you're seeing those kinds of bipart that, that kind of bipartisan sentiment, I think the time is ripe. It's a matter of just getting that structure and getting those roles and responsibilities defined and finding the right mechanism for that. Excellent. Excellent. I, I couldn't agree more, and and I'd I'd actually say that uh, that I was involved with a survey of state legislators across the country last year, and federalism and the Tenth Amendment and and Article Five were some of the areas that we explored, along with a lot of other uh, issues, and we discovered that uh, as Ken's quite correct that that it really does cross over a lot of political spectrums. Uh, uh, on the conservative side. Uh, those of us that are there are more aware of the uh, authority that states have, but but uh, if you look over on the progressive side of the, the aisle, <laughs> uh, there are some uh, uh, that also recognize this, and and uh, uh, that is a reason to be encouraged. Excellent, excellent. You know, and one thing I, I want to speak here, I know we've been addressing uh, state legislators and, and their role and things like that, but I want to speak to the folks in the audience. Uh, you know, take the time and meet your state rep. 
meet your state senator, uh, you know, they're neighbors of yours, they're uh, able to reach out to them much easier than trying to reach out to your US senator or to your uh, uh, house member, uh, get to know them. I find as I ask that question and talk with people say, hey, who's your state rep, who's your state senator? Well, they don't know. You know, so, you know, take the time to do that and, and inform them, find out what's important, not just reach out to them when they're doing something or something's happening that you don't agree with, but reach out to them, get to know them, understand what's important to them, and then at the same time, be able to share what's important to you. And uh, constitutional adherence uh, is, is very, very important and, and give them something to think about. So I'd really you know, challenge everybody to do that because that's how we're going to change it. Uh, there are a you are the state legislators are our agents to represent us in this republic. So I want to just challenge people to take the time to do that. Uh, you know, as far as building a nationwide collaboration path to reform, we're working with state legislative leaders to you know come together to talk about what are the issues that are common to all fifty states that that an agreement can be uh, reached and move forward. And then there's a lot of different ways to accomplish that. So, you know, that's, but it just stays taking, taking at it. I, I hate to say, you know, it's a marathon, but this stuff isn't gonna happen overnight, just like this election that we're in. We have to be patient. Uh, there's recount counts going on. Uh, there's legal challenges, things like that. And we've got to allow the process to work and, uh, uh, it, it just it works in. And, you know, in the few minutes that we have left, Ken, I know as I was reading some of your uh, uh, preparation material, you, you talked about the uh, Federalist 51 and the principles that are laid out in this compound republic. Can you just kind of address a bit, uh, you know, that role, that relationship between the states and the uh, national government? And what are some of the things that maybe the states have given up that they need to reclaim. And Ke Kevin, Kevin, you also, what are some of those things that states can reclaim? We've got some of those issues that come up, but those structural things that you've talked about, Kevin, what kinds of things do the states need to reclaim that they've kind of handed over to the national government, uh, really maybe through inaction? Yeah, you know, we can't defend lines that we can't define. And there's no state legislator training. Uh, it's interesting to ask the question, what was your state legislator training like? And, and, and invariably, there is none. And so to have no um, working clarity of the roles and responsibilities, those lines are blurred. And, and, and uh, you know, it's hard to defend lines we can't define. So uh, we're, we're in a situation where going back to what you talked about, Neil, with first principles, natural laws will win out in the end. The, the framers looked at ways to preserve liberty and they, they put as much natural law to this system of governance as they could. And they, you needed to divide power or power will accumulate. And you can only centralize power so long and then it will naturally devolve. And so at the state level, you can only borrow so much money at the national level and then you can't borrow anymore. And you can only centralize programming so much at the national level, and then it's going to devolve. Um, we had a, a, our last Democrat governor in Utah made the statement quoting Federalist 14 and said, the, the power is going to devolve back to the states. It's either gonna be on the, the state's terms or it's gonna be more haphazard, but power is going to find its voice back to the people. And so this is a time where we get to get ahead of that and in Federalist 51, he said, you divide power. And it's, it's uh, you know, the things that concern the lives, liberties, property of the people. Um, Justice Roberts in the NFIB decision, the chief justice said that the police power, the, the power over health, safety, welfare, morals is possessed by the states, but not the national government. That's a place to start looking at. The police power is possessed by the states, by 50 different states. So it's more local, more accountable. And as you start delving into issues of the police power, that's a critical place for this national federalism task force to begin working and looking at those police power matters being reserved to the states and not the national government and begin clarifying those lines so the states can work together and defend those. There are a lot of uh, uh, practical things that come up in uh, so many pieces of legislation 
Uh, and I, I found it quite useful for myself as a legislator when I first looked at a bill, especially if it interfaced with any uh, federal policies to, to ask the question, is this our job or is this the job of Congress or the president? And uh, nine times out of 10, they were assuming that it was their job when it was really a state issue. Um, I, I think back, uh, <laughs> uh, Congress passed a, a thing called the Real ID Act that required all states to comply with this particular standards for uh, driver's licenses and, and for some uh, practical uh, uh, reasons. But uh, the question again was, is this uh, the, uh, the tail wagging the dog or not? And, and you know, I would ask the question and, and then it, if, uh, if the answer is no, it's not lined up the right way, then you, at least you've got to speak out and see if you can't craft that legislation to make it work right so that the state's in charge of what it needs to be in charge of, or uh, maybe you just vote no, you know, and, and, uh, and you vote no while uh, letting people know why. Uh, you, you've, you've got to ask the question first and foremost, who's, whose business is this? Whose responsibility, who has the authority? Um, because I found that far too often that just wasn't the consideration that uh, was given to uh, uh, a lot of critical re legislation that we faced. Yeah, that is the key question. Let me, uh, let me start out and, and we'll just end with a quiz here. So for, for <laughs> quite a long time, we knew where this line was and see if you can guess who this is. It says Congress has been given the right to legislate on particular subjects, but this is not the case in the great matter of, of vital problems of government, such as the conduct of public utilities, of banks, of insurance, of business, of agriculture, education, social welfare, a dozen other important features in these, Washington must not be encouraged to interfere. Who, who would you think uh, had said such a thing, that, that dividing line? That was none other than Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt. <laughs> Governor as, Roosevelt. As a governor. And so for 150 years, we had a clear understanding of the line and the federal government operated on 3% of GDP. When there's no line, the federal government now uh, takes something on the order of 25, 26% of GDP and, and, and debt on top of that. And so this idea of clearly defining the roles and responsibilities again is essential. It's essential both for the effectiveness and accountability of government, but it's essential to, to, to restore that American voice and strengthen that American voice over such a diverse and wonderful nation. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's just, we've got so many different questions and ideas that uh, we did have one question and I don't think we can answer this, but you know, about states uh, giving up some of their rules of their responsibilities. And one of the things comes back to me is just how US senators were chosen. And they were chosen by state legislatures, and uh, the states gave up that uh, that role that they have to assure that they were being represented. Uh, you know, that's something that was the Seventeenth Amendment. And uh, again, as we ponder things and look at things that uh, you know are important in that uh, that compound republic or what I call that superstructure of our union that we need to balance. Uh, you know, looking at that, that's the kinds of things states and state legislators need to uh, uh, ponder and consider uh, going in. I think the next thing that I would encourage all to do is, is go on to our state legislators Article 5 caucus website and go ahead and, and sign up and join our caucus. One of the things that we've discussed both Ken and I and Kevin, and uh, actually we've got one of our steering committee members that's now moved from the New Mexico House of Representatives and now representing the second district of New Mexico in the US Congress. So again, uh, you know, become part of our caucus. Uh, we would like to have representation, have somebody from each state that's part of our uh, messaging and communication process that's going on. So I would ask, legislators and even the folks that are on the, uh, as attendees tonight sign up the newsletter that is put together every month has so much information it's great uh, i ask you to do that also follow our path to reform uh, facebook page and information that we have there and one last thing what i'm going to do before we're going to sign off here is i want everyone to save the date 
because the next in the series of uh, webinars will be protecting the American voice. And we are have that scheduled for Tuesday, January 26th, 2021. A lot of things should be settled by then. Uh, legislatures will be in session, things going on. So we'd sure like to uh, have you be part of that. Uh, Kevin, can last words? Do it. Okay. Don't just stand back and watch. Get engaged, get involved and do it. Yeah, th this is a wonderful time to be alive and, and we are the leaders that we've been looking for. It, it, it is the states, it's only gonna come from the states. And as John Dickinson said, it will be their own faults. <clears throat> states allow the federal government to interfere in their jurisdiction. So thank you all for being here and, and please with any questions, reach out, we'd be happy to help you move that forward. It's time to leverage and get our organizations uh, working forward on this and clarify those roles and responsibilities. Well, thank you, uh, Kevin and Ken, for taking the time and all of the participants to, uh, here at the webinar being there. Again, if you go to our state legislators uh, Article 5 website under the About tab, you can find all of our contact information. You can reach out to us directly. So uh, good evening. Thanks for being part of this. And uh, we'll see you again. Good night.